Hey guys, it's Nicole Mashburn, and today we're going to talk uh, about a little bit more on muscles. And I want to talk to you about uh, training, basically in athletes, and does it make a difference? Basically, what happens when you train as an athlete, and what are you doing to your muscles? So let me get my pen. Hang on. Okay. So what I have here are basically two athletes. I've basically got a marathoner, which is more of a long distance endurance, and I've got a sprinter. And um, there's very distinct differences between people who tend to be long distance endurance type athletes and people that can do things for short bursts of speed. And we're basically built different. Um, training can change that, but some of it is just your genetics. You're either a born sprinter or you're a born endurance runner. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, about that. Hopefully, you remember from your last lecture that uh, your muscles are made up of types of fibers, and these fibers are either aerobic or anaerobic. And most of your muscle has a little bit of all of these, but maybe a different combination uh, depending on your training. You may have more or less of one fiber than you do of another. Um, your aerobic fibers, we call your slow oxidative or your slow twitch, and they're your red fibers. Your fast oxidative, or your fast twitch, are your pink fibers. So if you look at the microscope and look at these fibers, they actually have a color to them. And then your anaerobic, or your fast glycolytic, are also fast twitch, and they're white. So when I say aerobic, I'm talking about using oxygen for, for uh, production of ATP. And if I talk about anaerobic, then no oxygen is being used for ATP. So hopefully you guys remember that from your previous lecture. If you don't, go back, watch that again, and make sure, make sure you understand the difference between aerobic and anaerobic and what that means. Now, I put this slide up because I have found it's kind of a neat way to, to uh, get uh, students to remember uh, those muscles. And when we talk about those uh, fibers, let's talk about these colors. The color is coming from basically hemoglobin, okay, it's the red blood inside these muscles. So these red fibers have a lot of hemoglobin in them, lots of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the protein that carries the iron, that carries the oxygen through your blood. And so when the iron binds oxygen, it basically rusts, gets that red color. So these cells have a lot of hemoglobin, they have a really uh, red color to them. So you know they have hemoglobin, they bind oxygen, they're aerobic. The pink fibers still have hemoglobin, they just don't have as much, so they're not as red. Again, they're aerobic, they just don't have that uh, dark red color. Then the white fibers, they just have the least amount of hemoglobin at, uh, of all the fibers, so they're more white. The, the hemoglobin's not there uh, in great amounts to give them that pink or red color, so they look more white. So what I like my students to do is think about where you have seen this uh, as an actual, uh, you've seen these colors. And what we know when we think about especially poultry, we have what we call dark meat and light, or you probably call it white, white meat. So when you're going to eat chicken, uh, you think uh, you want the drumstick, which is the dark meat, or you want the breast, which is the light meat on the chicken. Um, and those, are, those colors of that meat tell you something specifically. So I'm going to start by talking about the turkey. And uh, if you watched my orientation video at the very beginning, you remember, if you were in my class, that uh, or you talked talk to me before, you know I like to hunt. Uh, and the thing about the turkey is, if you ever have eaten turkey at Thanksgiving, they have that big white breast, and they have dark legs. Well, that dark meat is basically these red fibers, okay? These anaerobic, fi these aerobic fibers. Lots of hemoglobin. So think about what a turkey does. They can fly, right? They do fly, but not a whole lot. They do short bursts of flight. So just they may fly up to the tree or fly up to the roof. Most of the time are just spent walking around and running around. So if you've ever run across a wild turkey uh, in the woods, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna run. They're not gonna fly, they're gonna run. So they've got those dark legs, real aerobic. They can run for a long, long time. Uh, if they want to fly, it's a short burst of speed to get them up to a tree. So they have white meat on their breast. Now a duck or a goose is exactly the opposite. They have dark breast, and their legs uh, are, are more 
a pink color. They have lighter colored legs. So think about a duck. Uh, what does a duck or goose do? They fly for long, 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 long distances. These are the migratory birds. They fly for miles and miles and miles and miles. And so if you look at their breast, they have that dark meat, that endurance meat, okay, that aerobic meat. And their legs, usually not as dark, because again, they're going to swim a little bit, but they don't do a lot of running, they just kind of waddle around. So when you're kind of thinking about which one's the red fibers, and which one's aerobic, and which one's the light fibers, and which ones are anaerobic, think about a uh, chicken, and think about a duck. Think about what they're doing. Your endurance, um, endurance animals, like the goose or the duck that fly long, long distances, you have dark meat in their breast. Your turkey, which doesn't fly very far, it's kind of a short burst of speed to get up to a tree, and have white meat in the breast. And maybe that'll help you keep the two uh, separate. Helps me anyway. Maybe not. Maybe doesn't help you. So what happens uh, when you exercise? Well, in particular, if you do aerobic exercise, we call that endurance exercise. It's going to cause more capillaries to uh, come into the um, area, into the muscle. Capillaries are basically the really small blood vessels where exchange occurs, which brings in more oxygen to the area. So if you have more oxygen, you've got more mitochondria. So with more mitochondria plus more oxygen, you get more ATP. You're also going to make more myoglobin. And I said hemoglobin earlier. I actually meant to say myoglobin. Myoglobin is the protein, the muscle that uh, is binding to the, um, the iron to, to, to uh, allow you to use the oxygen. So I, I think I said hemoglobin, but I meant to say myoglobin. Um, this aerobic exercise, we do this endurance exercise, it's going to actually lead to greater endurance, greater strength, and it's going to make you more resistant to fatigue. Um, so if you're training for long distances, so say you're going to be a marathoner, and I've run a marathon, you don't just go out one day and say, hey, I think I'll run a marathon, and just take off and run 26.2 miles. No. You have to build up and you build up your aerobic capacity. So the first week, you know, you may run two miles, and then the next week you may run three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and so forth, until you finally built up the endurance to be able to do the whole 26 miles. So you have to, to do that. You're not just uh, born aerobically ready to run 26 miles. You've got to build that up. And what you're doing is you're increasing the capillaries of the muscle, increasing your mitochondria, increasing your myoglobin so that you've got plenty of ATP to make you more aerobic. Um, you can also convert some of your fast glycolytic into fast oxidative fibers. So you can actually have a little bit of a conversion going on. Let me go back to that original. So these fibers, these anaerobic fibers, you can actually convert to aerobic fibers. So the more aerobic fibers you have, the better you are at an endurance sport. So you have to train for it. Now what about resistance training? And I'm talking about like things like weightlifting. Uh, these are typically anaerobic. You don't do, you don't uh, lift things for long periods of time. These are short type of uh, events. And when you lift weights, this resistance training, it causes your muscles to hypertrophy, which means the fibers actually get bigger. So each individual muscle fiber is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to basically cause your whole muscle to look bigger, and then therefore it will be stronger. Uh, you'll get more mitochondria, you'll get more myofilaments, uh, you'll have more glycogen stores, more sugar stores, and some more connective tissue to hold that all together and make the muscle stronger. Now, what is the opposite of hypertrophy? most common uh, answer I hear is hypotrophy. That is not right, okay? It's atrophy. So when you exercise and do resistance training, your muscles will actually get bigger. And if you stop exercising and just quit, your muscles don't go back to fat. That's, people will say that, oh, my muscles just converted to fat. They don't. The muscles just get smaller or atrophy, and you probably, you're not using the calories anymore, so your body's starting to store more fat. So your arms will, legs will look bigger, they'll, they'll have more fat, but the muscle has not converted to fat, okay? The muscle has just atrophy. Uh, this is really uh, easy to see in someone who maybe has broken a leg, and so maybe they have a leg that's casted for several months. So when that cast comes off, there'll be a, a noticeable reduction in the size of the muscle and the mass of the leg and the casted leg versus the leg that has been used the whole time. That muscle just atrophied away. But then you can start exercising and build that back up cause it to hypertrophy. Alright, so when you overload a, a, a muscle, 
Um, that's one of the ways you can increase its strength and endurance. So you want to force a muscle to work hard. And when you do that, you're going to increase its strength and endurance. So if you're a weightlifter, uh, you've probably noticed that you go to the gym, maybe you've been lifting 5 or 10 pounds, and now you go, and that just seems easy. You just, there's no results. You just don't feel like anything's changing. You've got to stress that muscle. You've got to make it work hard. So this week, you need to lift 10 or 15 pounds. A couple of weeks, that'll seem like nothing. You need to lift 15 or 20 pounds. So the more weight you do over time, putting a stress on that muscle is going to cause it to increase its strength and um, endurance. Your muscles are very good at adapting to increased demand. Uh, if you run, you'll notice the first couple of weeks, you know, a mile it just seems like it's forever and your legs are just burning, they're so tired you can barely stand it. A couple of months, weeks, a couple of months go by and all of a sudden five miles just seems like a, you know, walk in the park, it's no big deal. Your muscles have adapted. But you have to overload them, you've got to put some pressure on those muscles. Uh, you got to work them hard to make them adapt and become stronger and have more endurance. So that whole uh, no pain, no gain, it, uh, it actually is true when you talk to muscles. You've got to, got to push them to make them stronger. All right, so how do we make uh, our muscles stronger? How do we generate more force? If I want to lift up uh, something uh, maybe light versus something heavy, what are my options to be able to lift up something heavy? Well. Um, without exercising at all, I can just recruit more muscle fiber. So if you think way back to a few lectures, we talked about motor units. Um, it might take me one motor unit to pick up this pencil. It may take me ten motor units to pick up you know, a, a, a weight or a phone book. So just recruit more muscle fibers. Um, I may want to recruit the larger muscle fibers. It may be that I need the small muscle fibers to pick up the pen. I need larger muscle fibers to uh, pick up something heavier. As I exercise my muscles and I cause my muscle fibers to get larger, they're going to become stronger. So the more large fibers I have, the stronger I am. Um, I can uh, give them more stimulation, so there's more signals coming from my brain and spinal cord out to my arm. I need to recruit uh, more muscle to work. And you also want your muscle and your sarcomere to be at the right length. Um, there's some, you do want to stretch your muscle a little bit to make it be at its optimum. And the way I like to think about this is, you know, say this is your muscle. Uh, think about your sarcomeres. So remember your sarcomeres? That's your, your filaments. So you got your little actinomycin. And they've got to be able to do this. Well, if they're already too contracted, if your muscles are too tight and they're contracted, there's really nowhere for the sarcomere to go, okay? It's not going to go anywhere. It's got to be stretched out a bit. If your sarcomeres are way stretched out and they're way out here, the actinomycin can't even get together <laughs> to bind. So there's got to be that optimal, uh, that optimal length, that optimal stretch so that your muscle is at its prime. So you do want to, when you get out of bed, you know, you feel real tight, you want to stretch out. It would be really hard to get out of bed and just go for a run. You just stretch those muscles out, get, those, get them at their prime, uh, optimum uh, stretched point, and then go exercise. Again, overstretching a muscle actually can cause damage and you won't get a really good contraction. So a combination of any of these or all of these will give you a stronger contraction force. So you'll, you'll can pick up something heavier. All right, so if, is there anything that limits you? Is there anything that, will, uh, that is kind of the limiting factor in making, seeing how strong a muscle can be? Well, how much oxygen you have? So if you've run a long way or you've been working out and you start to run out of breath, you kind of, you got to get that oxygen or you run out of food. You didn't eat enough, uh, you run out of sugar. Uh, when people hit the wall, uh, especially marathoners, somewhere around mile 20, they just hit the wall, they have basically used up all their sugar supplies. And so you need to be replenishing that food as you run or as you do it, an exercise. If you've ever watched the Tour de France, you'll notice that the, throughout the ride, the bikers will grab Cokes and goo and, and granola bars and all kinds of things. They've got to keep that fuel so that they can keep their endurance and, and keep uh, cycling. So these are definitely things that we tend to do uh, when we just, you know, we're just worn out. We work too hard and we just can't go any further. We've got to restore our oxygen supplies, get up, get, catch our breath, and restore our sugar supplies, eat some more food. Uh, so if you don't have enough oxygen, you don't have enough food, you can't make enough ATP. So if you don't have enough ATP, that's going to limit you. And again, that muscle tone. You've got to have your muscles in just the right uh, uh, stretch uh, for them to work optimally. So you want to make sure your muscle tone is right.
And you have noticed that. If you, like, when you wake up uh, in the middle of the night or, uh, or early in the morning you wake up and it's just like, ugh, you know, it's like you feel like a rag doll. It's like your muscles haven't toned up yet. You know, you haven't turned on your muscles and they're not, they're not ready to get. It's hard to just get out of bed and, and go run. Some people can't. I'm not. I'm more of a rag doll. It takes me a while to, to get going and, and, uh, and get my muscles uh, back ready to, to, to move. All right, so um, what's a cramp? This is, I usually get asked this, and usually that is a lack of ATP, and particularly the ATP for the calcium pump. Uh, so go back, think about what's going on at the neuromuscular junction and the muscle and the actin and the myosin and what's going on. Well, that calcium that's been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, if you've gotten rid of your, if you're out of ATP, uh, you don't have enough, you can't run that calcium pump, calcium's going to stay out into the cytoplasm and stay attached to troponin. Well, that's going to cause tropomyosin to still be uh, rolled off of the actin, and actin and myosin can stay bound. And so as long as they're bound, your muscle's going to be contracted, and that causes a cramp. So you've got to get some ATP in there so that you can start to pump that calcium out of the cytoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and relieve uh, that uh, cramp. Um, there are some people that say pickle, swear by pickle juice. Uh, I think that has something more to do with maybe getting your... Uh, electrolytes back in balance. Um, I've never actually tried that, but I have heard that that works. Uh, but again, you just need to get your ATP stores replenished and that will usually help you get your calcium out of the way and um, relieve that cramp. And that brings me to one more point I want to talk about, and that's rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is basically the stiffness of death, and that's what happens uh, usually within 48 to 72 hours after someone dies. And basically what happens is you're no longer breathing, so you're no longer, you no longer have oxygen, you're not making ATP anymore. Uh, and so the calcium is basically released out into the cytoplasm and the actin and the myosin bind. And so that calcium is causing the actin and the myosin to stay bind, bound, and so that's when people stiffen up and they have that, what's called rigor mortis. Um, and it will last for a while, uh, maybe another 24 to 72 hours, depending on the, the conditions, the temperature and humidity and things like that. And then your body will start to rot and basically the proteins start to break down. So when the body relaxes, that's because, uh, it's not because you've gotten any more ATP and started to pump the calcium back out. It's basically because the proteins acting in the myosin are now basically starting to degrade. And as they start to break down, the bonds break and the body goes limp. And so that's, uh, that's what is going on with rigor mortis. And so it's real, it's, um, there's a timeline of rigor mortis. So uh, if you're in an investigator, you can come in and you can make the time of death based on kind of where they are in that stage of going through rigor mortis and then relaxation. So that's all that is. It's just basically you're not breathing anymore, you're not making ATP, your calcium is not being pumped away, active mice are staying bound, and the, the body stiffens up. All right, well, that is it for your Unit 4 lecture. Um, if you have any questions, you can always contact me, send me an email, or any of the instructors here at Calhoun will be glad to help you. Good luck, and I'll see you soon.